point. Amen. Amen. Uh, this morning, we're putting together something because it's called respecting our birthright. And it's probably going to be a little different than what you think just by that title. But I, I want to say this. You guys have a birthright that God has given each one of you. And I don't believe we're operating in it to full capacity. It might take our whole life to do that, but we want you to get revelation of what you've got. We want you to understand. I, I mean, if you had some rich guy as your daddy and then you got the birthright to all that, do you know what you've got having... God is your father and Jesus, God making way for you to have full access to that birthright. I just think we're not operating on full capacity of what we've been given. And it's, the Bible says it's through lack of knowledge. So we're going to bring a few more tidbits here to help you with that. I thought we'd just share a little because what some of what we share this morning, we shared also in... We tell our, them where we went. Yeah, we were in Banning, California last week with... A sister church, Faith Builders Family Church. He works with us as a regional advocate uh, under for, our team with yeah, Andrew Womack. Yeah, we work for, with Army, which is Andrew Womack's network, Associated Related Ministries International. And we have an, an excellent team. And really, our team is the people that we worked with with Faith Ministries for 20 years, which is amazing because that just happened. And so... It's very cool. So Dan and Nancy are doing an excellent job because they are all of California and Washington, Oregon, Nevada, all these Western states, and they have been so diligent to go and connect and meet with these ministry leaders and business leaders and in Reno and Las Vegas and up in Washington. And so we've got a lot of people that are even coming for the September conference from out there. And it's just beautiful what God's doing in this time. There's going to be some world changers. Yeah, here. just a strengthening. There's going to be some wild people here. Yeah. Is that okay? Come on. Yeah. So anyway, we, one of the testimonies we had, I'm thinking of this one family that came to these meetings because there was five sessions we taught in through the weekend, last weekend. <clears throat> and one lady, I didn't recognize her, but she came up and said, I'm here because you got, I heard you guys were here. She said she'd been out of not going to church for three months. She's so disillusioned and burned out because a couple of the churches she was a part of had closed, and the circumstances which they closed was hurtful to her heart, and she was so involved. Anyway, so she and her husband and even a husband's sister were all there, and through prophetic ministry, Dennis had word for the And we didn't know any of this when Dennis was giving these words. You want to share what you... Well, any aspect of it. I just want to say that you call things out in people. You speak to them. You know God's restoring people without knowing those things. And then the whole family across <laughs> the thing is like, what's going on? God uses the gifts so he can affect people's lives. Yeah, to build So he can reach. Up. So he can say, I know that's God. How could he have known that? Well, so she, she came up to me then later, and well, first of all, the, the brother, the Jamie, the man, his sister came and got spirit-filled. She was so excited. Then Jamie got that prophetic word that God was not done with him yet, and then she, the, the other lady, Andrea, came, and she just said, I, I mean, she was shaking the last night we ministered, and she said, God is doing something in me, and my heart is changed, and I didn't want to come to church but this is my church now, and so she's joined with Dan and Nancy's church, and she's really got so many gifts and right. so many things to contribute and be a part of. So it was just such a beautiful work of restoration. And I'm just saying that to say if we let him do this through us, he has his ways of doing it through people. We just need to expect it. They had a birthright. Yes. Be connected with the church. And somehow it was sabotaged. And I told her, I God said, God restored. I said, ah, the, here's the thing. You, you are the church. So Say that again. You are the church. We're the church? Yeah, we can get it's mad. It's not at, a building? We can get mad at a church, but we still are the church. <laughs> and we, we just need to deal with our heart attitude, not get bitter, but get better, and let God restore us. And That reminds me of a story. Okay. This was years ago. I had a few ministers were here. 
And we went to Applebee's. How many remember Applebee's? They, they, used to be, they used to be open years ago. They're still open. And so these guys were all sitting there, and the waitress is up there. And so they started saying, hey, man, he's a pastor. He's, he's got a church right over there. And guess what she said? I got hurt in a church one time. And it prompted me to say, you know what? I used to go to a lot of bars, and I got hurt, but I kept going back. <laughs> I think it just took her off guard for a second. But how many know that's a lot of people's story in the church? And so we're, we're bringing them back, man, getting yeah. them healed and bringing them back. So, yeah, they're, it's life on the planet. I mean, whether you're in church or not, people dealings, you're going to have things. To, offenses will come, but you've got to know how to guard your own heart, deal with your own issues. But anyway, so we saw God do that. It was so powerful and beautiful. But so restoration's at work. And so just looking at origins of things, you know, I think about at the end of our lives, when we look back, most of what seems urgent is going to be long forgotten. And so what we'll thank God for or regret is how we handled what's truly important. So we could complain and remain or just get stuck there. Or we can say, okay, God, I'm going to choose to be thankful. Uh, these things that I'm frustrated about, I'm giving them to you, but I'm going to be thankful. And so then you get to move forward, and the Lord will open things up for you. He really is looking for a heart of gratitude. So if you stay hurt, you stay stuck? You do, mm -hmm. yes. You know, talking about Pentecost, and of course, was first celebrated when they came out of Egypt. Everybody know that? And when the law was given at Mount Sinai, you know, we see that Exodus 20, and on the same day of Pentecost, God, the, the next Pentecost, when the new believers came, God gave his spirit. So I want you to see, we, we see the law was given on Mount Sinai, and then in the new Pentecost, the spirit was given. How many know what we got's a better deal yeah. than what they Under had? grace, God wants uh, you to live supply-minded. He's our source of everything, not demand-minded. Put that little pick up there, grace. Well, uh, like Gabe. so many times we want a list of things to do. We think that's our Christian life, and it's not that. It's this relationship with the Lord. So we've got comparisons of law and grace. But uh, under grace, the Spirit supplies and empowers every good thing. Come on. We, we, I expect that. Gifts will manifest. Good things come out of this spirit relationship. Can we go through here? These? Yeah, sure. So when the law was given at Mount Sinai, we mentioned, there was a presence of a thick, dark cloud that gathered over the people. But when grace came on the Mount of Transfiguration, there was a bright cloud that overshadowed them. Which one you want? Come on. Yeah, come on. When the law was given, 3,000 people died. I mean, that's not a good thing. Okay. Uh, however, in Acts 2.4 depicts that 3,000 people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit, saved, uh, on Mount Zion, it shows where the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. What a contrast. So under the law, there was lightning and thunder and Exodus. You can read that, Exodus 20. But under grace, the Spirit came in like a mighty wind. Interesting, this contrast. Under law, God was far away from his people because it's that demand. But under grace, the glory of the Lord was in the presence of his people. And even when he left, even when he left because they rejected him, he left in a slow, reluctant manner. You can see that in Ezekiel. So the law demands and grace supplies. Let's, let's, let's look at that just for a second. The law demands and grace supplies. Uh, how many know that you and I couldn't live under the Old Testament law? 613 laws plus. And you couldn't do it. And yet... A whole generations of people, generations tried to do it only to be frustrated. Can you imagine when you look at Deuteronomy 28 and it gives you the list of all the things you got to do and then all the things you're not supposed to do if you want to be blessed and not cursed? 
How many know under that, every one of us would have been cursed? Because we couldn't have kept them completely like it's said to do. But grace does something a little different. Jesus became the sacrifice that was provided to bring God's grace to us so we don't have to be perfect. We're in Him, so it made us perfect. Amen. See, the grace supplies. You know, the law is demanding. It's make, trying to do one more thing, do one more thing, and then God will answer your prayer. Okay? Or that's but, our perception. Of it. That's our perception. But grace is our ability, excuse me, His ability that works through us that supplies every need we have. And I don't know about you, but the more I get this, the more I see supernatural provision. Yeah. Hello, can I get a, anybody understand that? It's like the more you know, truly know that God is good, that you're shifting your belief system, not waiting for the other shoe to drop. When you shift that and you expect the goodness of God, then you start seeing the goodness of God. Denise, I worked hard. I'm still a hard worker. But I worked and worked and worked to make things happen. And how many know God wanted to let me do it? You ever keep doing it in your own strength and God keeps letting you? And you say, God, I need your help. And he says, I was waiting, waiting for you to ask me. So I'm starting out there now. It doesn't mean I don't work hard. I work hard, but there's grace. There's peace provided. So we we're wanting to bring that up just to show you origins of things and then contrast, like Old Testament versus New Testament. So same goes for the fact that you are an inheritor of the firstborn blessing, where abundant life and health are yours. And you might look at that and think, what? What do you mean firstborn blessing? I was born third in my family. No. That's your but problem. in the body of Christ, we're firstborn the church is not a building, as I said, or an old religious organization. It's God's most brilliant plan from the very beginning. In the Old Testament, it was a hidden mystery. In the New Testament, it was brought to life through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And so th you can think of the most successful organizations you know, but the church, the bride of Christ, or the house of God, says in the scripture, it says we are one with Jesus. Now listen to this verse out of Hebrews 12. This is good. It, 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 some of you might think this is an obscure verse, but it, there's significance in it. 1222. Yeah, the whole passage is awesome because it's doing this contrast of Old Testament and New. But it says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So this church of the firstborn, we're the church of the firstborn because- now, how, how do I get to that church of the firstborn? Is that close to here <laughs> you're, somewhere? You're just in it. You're, and when you're born again, you're born into I'm it. In it. Because Jesus was the firstborn from the dead. Everybody get that? Who is the firstborn from the dead? And, and he, okay, he's the firstborn from the dead is what the scripture said. So we're in Christ once we're believers. So we are, the scripture says, the church of the firstborn. So we want to look at these two stories in the Old Testament that show this contrast because it'll help you really grasp and get a foundation on who you are and what we have and you won't despise your inheritance. You, you know, in the Old Testament, the firstborn who receives the double portion. Uh, but God did it a little different in the new covenant that we've got here today. Uh, Elisha was a servant and apprentice of Elijah. How many remember those two guys? Prophets in their day. And Elijah was about to be taken away by the Lord. And he asked Elisha, what he wanted. Can you imagine? I'm ready to go, be with the Lord. And understand, he didn't die. He left physically when he left. Elijah did. Did you ever think about that? Really, so really he was a prophet. God did miracles for him. Next thing, so he looks to Elisha. He says, what do you want before I leave? Boy, that's when you want to start speaking big, thinking big. You know, when God sends a prophet and asks you what you want. You with me? Go ahead. Where did that. you read this here? Not all of it. Elisha asked his inheritance of the firstborn blessing. He asked for he, a double portion. 
Upon hearing that, Elisha said he'd receive a double portion he desired if he witnessed Elijah being whisked away in this chariot of fire, yeah. boy, which, be, he, which he did. I'd be looking for a fiery chariot coming so down. So what I like, I wrote, I just hand wrote this scripture out of the Passion. I think it's the Passion. Maybe not. No, it can't be. No, so it must be a different translation. But listen to this. So uh, in verse 6 of 2 Kings 2, it says, uh, Elisha saying, I will never leave you. And then in the next verse, verse starting verse 7, 50 men from the group, these prophets, also went and watched from a distance. That's interesting. So remember what he'd said to him: If you see me go, then you get what you're asking. Why did those other fifty guys stand back? And the other guys were fifty were back fifty feet. No, they weren't back. I'm just teasing. Could have been fifty guys. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the prophet went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the river Jordan. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it, and the river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. And when they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. And Elijah said, you've asked a difficult thing, but if you see me when I'm taken from you, then you'll get your request. If not, you won't. And as they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared drawn by a horse of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried away. He, and when Elijah, Elisha saw it, he cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. And Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up, and he returned to the bank of the Jordan River. But the story is so powerful, and it's showing you clearly the importance of this closeness of their relationship and how he received this inheritance. But there's a type in it of Jesus, because he's the firstborn at the cross, and when he cried out at the end, he's cried out, my God, my God, instead of my father, which he did acknowledge him as father. He said, um, in Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But by him saying, my God, through this divine exchange, you and I could receive the spirit of sonship uh -oh. and call God our Father. And this is our portion as the firstborn. Do you realize that before this time, the cross, the believers, are, the people of faith, the Jews, didn't, didn't realize they could call God Father. He was more like master. Well, father, as you knew him uh, in the Old Testament, was just listed a few times. People didn't see God as their father like we do in the New Covenant. So it's profound, really, what's happened. Now that we're in Christ, he's our father. He's our daddy. And when you approach God as your father, because of things like the priests going in, they used to tie a rope around the high priest when he went into the Holy of Holies. And if he messed up, boy, he got struck dead and they have to pull him out by the rope. Now, are you, wanting to, are you looking to God as father? Or you're, you're dodging him, man, if you can. But so, now, God is a loving father, an Abba father. So this story demonstrates how the spirit of the firstborn is the spirit that cries out, my father. Come on. Now, the one thing I do want to say that was brought up, a lot of people use uh, this thing with Elisha and Elijah to ask God for a double portion. Now, I, I would ask you this. You can ask for a double portion if you want, but when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, I got the whole person. So I don't know if you, got a, you want a two fingers, you want a double portion, what you want, but I got the whole person. And so in the New Covenant, I don't need a double portion. I got the whole person. So, and, and more of the deal is, and we've brought this up before, is not getting more of the Spirit, but releasing more of it. And as our belief system being persuaded, mm -hmm. who we Fully are, persuaded. what we have, how to release it. So then the next one that is so powerful also is the firstborn blessing as seen in the story of Jacob and Esau. 
I remember those twins. And they're twin sons of Isaac. And I, I read this, it's so cool, out of the passion. So I'll read portions, but you go ahead and say what you wanted to say. Well, you want me, no, just start reading, that's fine. We, you want me to start it there or there? Yeah, go ahead and read that. And, yeah. then I'll and Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. So we got this father, and he's got one that's a hunter and one that's a little bit of a mama's boy, okay, back here, right? And, and so Jacob and Esau were twin sons to Isaac. But it says, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked the stew, and Esau came from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me. Some of those, red, some red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what good is a birthright to me? And then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew with lentils. And he ate and drank and arose and went his way. And Esau despised his birthright. And in the Passion, it says uh, Esau cared nothing about his own birthright. That he would just in that moment of hunger and temptation sell out like that. And what kind of value would you have in your birthright if you sold it out for a bowl of beans? Come on. And then... Then as it unfolds and he does go hunting and he brings back the stew for his dad. Wow. I'll just read it here where the father, here's what the father said. He said, ah, oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of a lush field and Yahweh, that Yahweh's blessed. May God give you heaven's dew, the fatness of the earth, and an abundance of grain and new wine. So here's this blessing the father's pronouncing over him, over uh, Jacob. Let people serve you and nations bow to, down to you. May you be master over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Those who curse you will be cursed, and those who bless you will be blessed. Wow. Wow. And then, no sooner than Jacob had left, then I, Esau came in, and he prepared a meal, and he came in to feed his dad. And he said, the dad said, Isaac said, who are you? And he said, I'm Esau. And when Isaac realized what had happened, he began to tremble and shake violently. He said, and this is significant, because it's showing us how important a spoken blessing is. It can't be revoked. Cool. I mean, so much so, you, you know, you and I would think, oh, just say, you, you're a cheater, you're a liar. Bring the other one in here, and I'll redo this. Well, no, it didn't work like that. You believe they saw a spoken blessing as powerful to the point that once I gave it, it was over with. He got it. Incredible. So when Isaac realized what had happened, he, shake, he shook violently. He said, no, Esau. Esau. Or no, Isaac, Isaac, the father. I'm yeah, sorry. he said, who was it then that hunted wild game and brought it to me? I've already eaten it. I gave him the blessing, and yes, he'll be blessed indeed. And when Esau heard this, he burst into bitter weeping and uncontrollable sobbing. He said, bless me too, father. And Isaac said, your brother was here, deceived me, and he's taken away your blessing. Esau said, Jacob, that heel grabber, because that's what his name meant, then, in which Did you guys realize that Esau came out first and, uh, pardon? Esau came out first and then Jacob grabbed his heel. It was almost like, and there's a part in here that talks about yeah. they were fighting in the womb. Yeah, this is a, listen to this. When she was pregnant, they were, there was so much struggling with each other inside her womb. She went to inquire of Yahweh saying, why do I have to live with this? And Yahweh said, the two sons in your womb will be two nations. Two people within wow. you will become rivals. And one will become stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And then she had the twins, and that's what happened, and this is how it went down. And when Esau said that he was so angry, he said, uh, haven't you reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac said, you don't understand 
My blessing will empower him to be master over you, and I've already given him all his brothers mm. and relatives and servants. My blessing will richly provide him with grain and new wine, which for us typifies our communion, our healing, and our forgiveness of sins. Wow. Beautiful. Anyway, Esau pleaded with this father, is that the only blessing you have to give? Bless me too, father. And he couldn't hold back his tears and wept loudly. And then Isaac spoke these words over Esau. You will live far from the earth's bounty and far from heaven's dew on high, and you'll live by the sword and serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you'll break free from his control. It's incredible how this can shape the future of his children. So we got to see that. The words we speak are shaping the future of our children and grandchildren. Wow. So this, this reference to fatness of the earth was given first because Esai would be a man with his heart attached to the world. He lived by the sword, always retaliating, unable to forgive. How many believers today have enough of God to get by but lived with unresolved anger and unforgiveness like Esau? Even the book of Hebrews describes Esau as careless about God's blessing. And the, es the descendants of Esau were known as Edomites. They were a violent people who raided caravans and pillaged cities. Wow. And then we know the story, an amazing blessed life, even though he had difficulties. And of course, God wasn't commending him for his deceit. Yeah, let's, let's touch on that a minute. It almost looks like uh, if you can deceive your father, you can get God's blessing. You can get that blessing. Let's look at that. We had somebody that kind of Esau gave up his birthright. He didn't care about it. He didn't value it. And so his brother says, I want it. I want to be blessed. I want to walk in my father's ble my blessing. And so his mother was in on the deal. And I'm not saying this is what we're to do, but I think what we need to do is recognize what God's wanting to give you as a firstborn child and not get rid of it, not take it for nothing. You know, I was thinking about this when I came here this morning. How many remember Howard Hughes? Yeah. I think he died in like 1976 or something. And how many know he was a very wealthy man? He owned TWA along with a bunch of other things. And he had a bunch of people just after his money and his family, you know, didn't care much about. Uh, and there was some guy that picked him up. They even made a movie about this. He, he got, oh, yeah. car broke down or something. And so this guy in this old beat up truck pulls and picks up, takes him down the road, gets him singing with him, that kind of thing. And so he took him where he needed to go. And somehow... Howard got one of his attorneys, whatever, to put together this document that says this guy got the whole thing, his whole inheritance. Of course, when Howard actually died and this guy brought this letter to him, of course, all the relatives fought it and said it wasn't real and so forth. So I don't know if the guy got anything or not, but these people are all looking for it. I want to say to you, God is not looking to get out of Blessing you. God is trying to get you what you have in your inheritance. And, and in Christ, we have it already, but do we acknowledge it? Do we know what we got? Yeah. So even though Jacob wrongly deceived his father to get the firstborn blessing, he was someone who respected his birthright. Say it again. And God honored that. Someone that does what? He respected his birthright. Listen to this. Do we respect ours? Yes. In Hebrews 12, 16, it says this. It's a reference about Esau. Remember now, this is an Old Testament story that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. Be careful that no one among you lives in immorality, becoming careless about, how God, about God's blessing, like Esau, who traded away his rights as the firstborn for a simple meal. And we know that later on, when he wanted to inherit his father's blessing, he was turned away, even though he begged for it with bitter tears. For it was too late to repent. Whoa. Now, I wouldn't normally look at a scripture like that, but it's in there. In Aramaic, it can be translated, he found no place of restoration. And you're going to need to help me with this, Denise. But we look at two similar stories. One with Abraham, who had two children. 
and he had one with his wife, and then he had one with his maid, right? right. And so when that happened, uh, the, first, the second son was sent away. Not his son with his wife, Rebecca, correct? I'm not tracking totally. Yeah, I'm trying. The first son. Pardon? So he took off, and then the, with his handmaid, she, they were sent out by his wife. And some people believe that was the start of the race where the Ishmaelites mm -hmm. came out. Right. And we know that's causing problems in the Mideast today. Okay, and so here we have now with Esau, he kind of went off that direction. He got mad, he was angry, and he went the same direction. Yeah, he, it, it, God told, uh, or Isaac and Rebecca told him, their son Jacob, to leave town. Well, the son, Esau was trying to, was wanting to kill his brother because of what happened. And so his parents said, leave and do not marry one of the Canaanites. Go and go to your uncle's house and marry one of them. And then didn't And then Esau the other brother, just, just out of spite, he goes and marries an Ishmael's daughter. So you can see they were parting philosophies right there. And, and this is important. Don't let what somebody else does affect your heart and affect your decisions yeah, the, and what you're going to do. Your bitter response. And so many people have this bitter response and then call it, God led me, blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know. We, Slap them one time and say no. And, and same thing goes, and I, I'm going to switch gears a minute. Yes, ma'am. Because we're talking about our birthright. And the same goes for our nation. And so I'm just going to do this commercial. These two books, they're so powerful and beautiful. This one's called Miraculous Milestones in Science, Medicine, and Innovation by William Federer. Oh, it's so good. These little short stories that are so Move inspirational. On. And this one, which I'm going to read out yes. of, Miracles in American History, How We Became a Nation, The Things That God Did. And, you know, m most kids don't even know right. our true heritage. Right. And so I'm just going to sh share with you one story because it, it fits with what we're saying about our birthright. But did you know that after the signing of the Declaration is really where some of the, the well, it's actual factual, the biggest battle happened after the signing. And so I just want to read this to you. But... Washington had prayed and uh, no, give, I have a praying president. Well, he wasn't the president yet, but General George Washington ordered a day of fasting and prayer humbly to supplicate the mercy of the Almighty. So this was important. He did that on May 15th. And then just a month later, this happened after the signing. July 9th. 1776, Washington's men were encouraged when messengers from Philadelphia brought a copy of the recently passed declaration. Washington read it out loud. It acknowledges God four times. Yes. Laws of nature and nature's God. All men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator. Certain unalienable rights appealing to the supreme judge of the world and then firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. So here's what happened. Washington expected the British to attack from the sea as they did at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Instead, 10,000 British troops landed a distance from New York and a British loyalist led them through the Jamaica Pass, marching all night to make a surprise attack on the army from behind the Continental Army. And on August 27th, an estimated 3,000 Americans, 3,000, isn't that interesting? In New York, were killed or wounded compared to only 392 British casualties. So the Battle of Brooklyn Heights was the first major battle after America had declared its independence, and it was the largest battle of the entire war, Washington watched 400 brave soldiers of the 1st Regiment, 1st Maryland Regiment, charge six times to their deaths directly into British lines. 
allowing the rest of the Continental Army to find cover, he said, good God, what brave fellows I have lost this day. British General Howe trapped the American troops on Brooklyn Heights with their backs against the sea that, and that night, Washington made the desperate decision to evacuate his entire army by ferrying it across the East River to Manhattan Island. The sea was boisterous where the British ships were, but providentially calm in the East River, allowing Washington's boats to transport troops, horses, and cannons. And as the sun began to rise, Half of the American troops were still in danger, but miraculously, a thick fog lingered, Come blocking on, fog. the evacuation from being seen by the British. Can God do that? Can God put a so, curtain up? Uh, the chief of intelligence wrote, as the dawn of the next day approached, those of us that remained in the trenches became anxious for our safety. And when the dawn appeared, there were several regiments still on duty. At this time, this dense fog began to rise off the river, and it seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this, partic this peculiar providential occurrence perfectly well. And so very dense was the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a man six yards ahead. We tarried until sun had risen, but the fog remained as dense as ever. So... Washington was on the last boat that left Brooklyn Heights. The British never again had such an opportunity to capture the entire American army at one time. Had the Americans not been able to evacuate, they would have been captured by Washington, and Washington would have been hung. America would have continued just as Come another on. colony in Britain's expanding global empire along with India, Kenya, Egypt, South Africa, and Australia. So Washington wrote later, undergoing the strangest vicissitudes that perhaps ever attended any one contest since creation, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this, the course of the war, that he must be worse than an infidel if he lacks faith. But it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases. So Samuel Adams wrote, the astonishing providence in our favor, our success has staggered our enemies and almost given faith to infidels. So we may truly say it is not our own arm which has saved us. The hand of heaven appears to have led us to be perhaps humble instruments and means in that great providential dispensation which is completing. Anyway, I just thought that was so profound. One battle... After, and isn't it true, like Mark 4, 17 says, Satan comes with affliction and persecution for the word's sake. So right at the birth, the signing of the declaration, four days later, you have the worst battle. Stuff hit the fan. Yes. Come on. But God delivered them. Isn't that miraculous? And so I just thought of our inheritance and our heritage and how important it is for us as Americans... Come on. Of course, we're part of the kingdom of God, but we need to recognize what heritage we have, both in the kingdom and in uh, our nation. I thought it was interesting that George Washington made sure all his troops were out, and he was on the last boat out. Same with out of Afghanistan. Biden was the last one out, right? Yeah. I mean, just... <laughs> But I'm just showing you the difference of people that actually care about people. Come on. I didn't want to go there. Like that. Yeah. I think you want to go, huh? there. go ahead and start where you want. So, again, remember we said firstborn from the dead and that we're a kingdom. And it, Revelation says in Revelation 1, 5, and 6 that we're a kingdom of priests and uh, kings, and because of what Jesus did, we're no longer just natural people, but uh, this really inspired me, and as we taught some of this in California, it helped me, uh, you know, sometimes you think, well, why would I want to prophesy to somebody? But when you see yourself as a kingdom person filled with gifts, you're, you can prophesy over your city with authority, you can prophesy over someone else when you just are moved with compassion for someone. Oh, I felt that, yes. 
you're moved with compassion and you can't help it comes up out of you. You see a, you see something brighter for this person than they might see for themselves. And it comes up and comes out. And that's because we're a kingdom of priests and kings and kings. priests. Come on. Yeah. So where the word of the king is, there's power and authority. So if you're a king and a priest, there's power and authority in your words? Yes. Say, it, say it like you mean it. Yes. yes. A king doesn't have to work to make things happen, right? So that's why when Jesus was on earth, he only needed to speak and the leper was cleansed. Deaf ears were opened. We had so many healings, people testifying of healings out in California. Just through the preaching of the word, they were receiving. So God's will is for you to prosper in all things. Now, people hear that. Say that that one more time. People even hear the word prosper and they get hung up. But this is what the scripture says. 3 John 1, 2. It, God's will is for you to prosper in all things, be in health, even as your soul prospers. I used to remember that after a series of months of good things happened, something bad had to happen. But I never found that scripture. How many know things can keep happening? Good, good, good. And we've got God's perspective. We can speak out things to be created, to live and Curse those things that aren't. So when you know you're under an attack, that and of course this, uh, the devil uses the mind more than anything, the mind and what we believe, because he really doesn't have the power to do this stuff. He does it through cooperation of people. But what I'm saying is the attacks lose their power the moment you start speaking against them. Jesus demonstrated the power of speaking when he cursed a fig tree. And it dried up at its roots. Why was he? I mean, that's really just like a lesson in faith to us that we see what happens. And he didn't know about it till the next day. So we too, though, we're joint heirs with Christ. And we've got the same inheritance, birthright, and position as a king. So we've got to use our authority against the powers of darkness. You know, just this movie. We need to start speaking against this. And... Taking exposure action. of the enemy's yeah. plans that are actually doing it. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about I, in previous teachings about light. Jesus is the light of the world. When we let that light out through, and through our speaking, we are dispelling darkness. I mean, it takes action as well as our speaking, but they both go That's together. Right. We too have the same inheritance. I said that. You said it? I want to, I wanted to read it again. It's okay. okay. Same inheritance, birthright, and position as a king in God's eyes. Right? So let's use our authority against the forces of darkness. So if they are so, uh, they need to be in God's eyes, are they in my eyes? Do I see those things in my eyes as my birthright inheritance and as a king? Uh, the firstborn blessing includes not only the kingly portion, but the priestly portion. You want to tell us the difference between the kingly portion and the priestly? Well, portion? let's look at it. A king and a priest. A priest has to do with speaking, and a priest has to do with ministering to God on behalf of the people. And Jesus was a king and a priest. Yeah, Jesus was our high priest and ministered to God on our behalf. And when we worship God, we're actually operating in our priestly role, ministering to the Lord. Yeah, so that's important. You know, us just hearing that, how can we minister to the Lord? How would you describe that? I would say thanking and worshiping Him. Yeah. So I'm hanging out with Him. I'm acknowledging who He is, that He's my King. He is the one that accomplishes everything He wants to do through me. So I thank him every day. I minister to him. You, you know, the best way to minister to him is to believe him. When you believe what he says, you're ministering unto the Lord. Yeah, take him at his word. Yes. So it's beautiful. God, we just thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit and for what we have in you as kings and priests. God, for our great inheritance, both in this nation 
and in your kingdom. And Lord, I pray for each one of us that this revelation will just blow open completely and you'll show us who you've caused us to be in your kingdom and how to flow and how to operate and how to speak. Yes. And so we, we commit ourselves to you again. I, I want, if you want to pray this prayer, could you guys stand up? I want to walk you through that, that you, you confess what we've talked about here today. Hallelujah. Say, thank you, Father, thank you, Father. that I received an inheritance. I have an inheritance right now. You have made me your son. <laughs> Even when I didn't deserve it. Your kingdom is my kingdom. And everything in it is given to me to use in Jesus' name. Now, I just want you to imagine that for a minute. I want you to imagine everything that you need, everything you've been called to do has already been provided for. And God is just waiting for people to see that and receive it. I pray right now you see yourself receiving everything you've been called to do. You've been given everything that pertains to life and to godliness. Now, Father, I pray that these people see that and start speaking out the things, cursing those things that need to be cursed, blessing those things that need to be blessed. I pray they see their words as powerful as Jesus' words. Amen. How many here believe that your words are as powerful as Jesus' words because you're speaking His words? Thank you, Lord. And God, for your finished work, for your Lord, healing, and for your forgiveness of sins that's represented in the blessing of the grain and wine, God, that the broken body, you took our judgment, you Thank took you. our place, you did it already. We don't have to bear that burden. You did it and we receive it and acknowledge it. And for your blood, the cleansing and forgiveness that we are now empowered. Whoever has for been forgiven much, loves much. God, we're free to love like you love. In Jesus' God, name. We just right now say we, we value our birthright. We value our birthright in you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. And because of that birthright, God, we have everything. We've been blessed. We've been made to prosper, made whole, made complete, God. We lack no good thing. Right now, if you had some things in your body that have been affecting you, right now, in the name of Jesus, you are healed. You are healed. Healing is yours. Healing is the children's bread. Father, I just thank you that bodies here are being restored. And, and there's some that you've had a long time. And I would just say this to you. You've got a little bit more faith in what you've had a long time. And so now we just correct that. We move it around and say, Jesus, your healing is forever. <laughs> it's forever and it's in me right now in the name of Jesus. Ooh, da, 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 you're changing your view on that stuff. Thank you, God. Just thank you. That I, I'm just calling this in. Father, there are people here that have been created to prosper. They've been created to have lots of finances, God, for these last days. God, I just thank you. There are people that are collecting. They're wanting their inheritance now, God, so they can start producing, God, what you've given them to in Jesus' name. Right now. We declare every need met in this church body. Thank you for people Beth. valuing their birthright and their inheritance and their calling in whatever way where you might have felt this seems so insignificant. God said it's not, that it's all needed, every part, every joint supplies. So I thank you, Father, for connecting thank this you. body of people to their point of connection in this church family. In Jesus' name. I was supposed to say this uh, to Layla and Everett, but Layla specifically, uh, you were called to prosper. Amen. You were called to prosper. You were called to have finances that you were to distribute in these hours.